Welcome to Savvy Central Radio's interview slash networking extravaganza with our guest Rochelle Kana, author of Healing Autoimmunity for Women. Before we start our interview with Rochelle, we'd like to thank our sponsors and contributors for our May 23rd live event. They are Heather Jadis of Beauty on a Mission, Jane Lorenz of CYA Aprons. Winty.com, an aviation-themed t-shirt and graphic design business. Christy Fletcher of ModernWellness.com. Regina Huber of Transform Your Performance. Bruce Marciano of Marciano's Ministries. And the film, Allison's Choice. And our contributors, The Paleo Mom, Exo bars made from cricket powder and batch organic soaps at batchorganics.com. Our guest today is Rochelle Kana, author of 30 Days of Prayer Healing Autoimmunity for Women. Since 2001, Rochelle has worked as a psychotherapist in Manhattan. Helping women restore their health and vitality to their lives. In early 2014, she was diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease and began experiencing autoimmune reactions to food. Since then, she has focused on our personal healing as well as this wonderful new book, a devotional and collection of reflections and activities and prayers. To find out more about Rochelle and her new book, visit 30daysofprayer.org. Welcome, everyone, to Savvy Central Radio. I'm so excited to have you join us for our second live event, Rochelle. Welcome to Savvy Central Radio. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you share. Now, not everyone in this room knows you. Most people do. But for the people who don't know you, share a little bit about your story and what led you to writing your book. Okay. Yeah. That is a long story, but I'm going to try to make it as short as possible. Uh, my name is Rochelle Kana, and I have been a psychotherapist for over 10 years. And I was in the midst of starting my private practice over a year ago, a little over a year ago. I was going to help women get linked up with health care services, uh, possibly because they needed health care instead of psychotherapy, because I was under the impression that physical illness often leads to psychiatric illness as well. Um, so I had this plan, and then March 3rd of last year, I was coming home from the gym. I was as healthy as I'd ever been, mm -hmm. and I uh, came home, and I collapsed into nine days of seizures without sleeping. Mm -hmm. I lost my vision and my hearing. I couldn't talk. I couldn't walk. I couldn't think. I was hallucinating. I was stuck in my bedroom. I had been to the emergency room twice. And the doctor said that there was nothing wrong with me. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided, because I did have a background in uh, mental health, that if I didn't sleep on the ninth day that I needed to be checked into a psychiatric ward. Uh, luckily, I found an osteopath who agreed to meet with me and didn't think that I was crazy. She manipulated my back, and she got me allowed me to sleep that weekend. So I knew that if I could go to sleep that I would be able to, to get myself stabilized. So I met with the osteopath, she stabilized me. Uh, a very, this, the very abbreviated version is, is that through my uh, prayer and intuition, I found the right physicians. I was diagnosed with Lyme disease in July, the end of July, and about a month after receiving treatment, I was uh, starting to get better. Mm. So that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> yeah. So 30 Days of Prayer, it's an amazing journey that you've gone through, this har harrowing journey. Now, so many today are dealing with autoimmune issues. Why is it such a place playing such a role in modern day society? And how can we start to change that trend? So some of you might be wondering why... I, having Lyme disease, I'm speaking about autoimmune diseases. A lot of people don't uh, associate Lyme disease as an autoimmune disease. Some people do. Uh, autoimmunity just means that your immune system is producing antibodies to attack the healthy parts of your body. And most diseases, most chronic illnesses now, we know, come from some sort of inflammation and dysregulation often in the immune system. So there are lots of reasons why currently we are having this rise in autoimmune diseases. One 
is systemic infections. Lyme disease is a bacterial infection. Uh, Lyme and other bacterial infections and systemic infections are not easily diagnosed in the United States. There are hundreds of them, and our doctors currently do not know how to test for these diseases. Mm -hmm. I was tested three times, told that I did not have Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. I was tested a fourth time, told that I might partially have Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. And then when I started the treatment, I began to recover. Mm -hmm. So today, my general practitioner, based on the CDC, would not believe that I have Lyme disease. My insurance does not cover this. Uh, So one is systemic infections that people don't know that they have, which are very common. Uh, One is misdiagnosis as well. A lot of people that have multiple sclerosis actually have a systemic infection. It's just undiagnosed. Not all, but some. Our food, the things that we're eating, processed foods we know cause inflammation, uh, which lead to our immune system being overactivated. Over-exercising. A lot of people uh, these days are into, I love CrossFit. I love, love CrossFit. But it's it's very uh, stressful on the immune system. So over-exercising can also trigger an autoimmune disease. Trauma, if you're in a car accident, uh, physical trauma or mental trauma. Also stress, just the general day-to-day, I'm not taking care of my cortisol levels, can cause autoimmune diseases. And there are factors that we don't know Mm. as well. Yeah. So anyone out there suffering from like unknown symptoms and they don't even know where to begin and their doctor is not helping them, where would you tell them to start? Prayer. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I mean, that might be a first place. Or becoming still. My book is all about just becoming still, whether it's through meditation or prayer or whatever your uh, choice of being quiet is. Maybe it's on your bike in France. That's an awesome way to become (laughs) quiet as well. Yeah. Um, uh, But also, you know, Google is fantastic. Uh, Google, Facebook forums. I was actually diagnosed with Lyme through a Facebook group. Hmm. They told me I had Lyme disease. I did not know what Lyme disease was. Uh, so there are <clears throat> there are tons of resources out there, and my suggestion would just be to start asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. And what part do you think nutrition pay- plays in helping autoimmunity get back to wellness? So n- nutrition... Uh, My personal belief is that becoming still through meditation or prayer is the basis of our healing. Mm. Some people might put nutrition under that, uh, but nutrition is second to me in terms of of healing. If I don't have my quiet, then I can't choose what foods I am supposed to be eating. Yeah, because actually you're in a state of panic. At that point, all you're thinking is, I feel awful, and you're in a state of panic, and then no possible resolution can come to you in, in that state. Right. But then food is, is the next yeah. step. Absolutely. And you had mentioned going through this. It was actually a blessing, which I found strange at first. You're like, a blessing? This is horrible. Why, why did you say it was a blessing for you now? Well, as Carrie had said earlier, actually, I, am, I was in tremendous pain. I had encephalitis-like symptoms, so my brain and spinal cord were on fire. I, I, it felt like there was a flame above my head, about two feet above my head. Um, so pain really pushed me into, um, into a better place. Mm-hmm. I was, when I was having seizures, I was capable of finding a place of stillness during these episodes of intense pain. Mm -hmm. And I was only able to do that, I think, because at 12 or 13 years of age, my minister taught us how to meditate and how to pray. And I've been meditating since I was 12 Mm -hmm. uh, years old. So when I started to have the seizures, I started meditating through them. And on the other side of that, I had an awakening experience. I And I don't know how to physically describe it to someone other than I woke up. And when I woke up, I was the observer to my pain. I was no longer my pain. Mm -hmm. So I was witnessing my body in pain. And I realized that, like, my body, I love my body, but my body actually doesn't matter. I am not my body. I'm bigger than my body. Mm -hmm. So when I, and then I really started to heal after that. And after that happened, 
I'm healthier now, I'm happier now, I'm more confident now than I've ever been. Yeah, so. I totally see it. You're vibrant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I, I, I'm thinking many out there might have not had your experience being led through prayer and meditation, and they might be in a great deal of pain. Where would you tell them to start today if they have no meditation practice, really have never prayed? Where should be their first starting point? Anything that you enjoy would probably be the first starting point. Just getting back into when we're in pain, even when I was in pain, I was really avoiding things that I enjoyed. I was afraid to leave the house mm -hmm. at one point. Um, so trying to get back into your life. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are also Dina Proctor, whom some of you here are even friends with. Dina has a great three minute a day meditation. So you meditate three minutes, three times a day. Mm -hmm. So even if you just take very small bits of your day, um, I think that's a, that's a great place to start. Yeah, I like that advice. And very early on when I started exercise, I was so out of weight and out of shape that I had to start with just five minutes worth of exercise and then build it to 10 minutes and then build it, you know, because uh, I think often people think it's too big of a challenge to work to get into full wellness. Let me just go and pop a pill, go to my doctor and get the magic pill and woof, I'm all better. But, you know, wellness can be achieved bit by bit. It doesn't have to be an overnight process, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, it's helpful if, if you have people encouraging you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would en encourage you to seek out people who, who are going to help you uh, get better. Yeah. And now you're mentioning a very good point. Not only you mentioned prayer before, which is a very in meditation and finding that spiritual center to get back into wellness, but also community, which you just brought up. Um, how important is bringing those two elements together to achieving full wellness? Well, from my experience, I've lived in, I'm originally from West Virginia, and I came from a very small town, and I had lots of friends and family around me until I came to New York to graduate school. And for years, from graduate school up until, uh, mm -hmm. well, I would say about a year and a half ago, I wasn't aware of how lonely that I was. Mm -hmm. I still had a family. I still, I married a wonderful man, and um, I had friends, and I had things around me, but something was unattended to about me that I was feeling very isolated mm -hmm. and very lonely. Maybe because it wasn't the same as living in a small community, so I just didn't, it didn't feel like I was being nurtured. Mm -hmm. That said, when we are lonely, when we experience the feeling of loneliness, our immune system does this wonderful thing, but it's also a very dangerous thing because it responds as if you are in trouble Hmm. And it, it produces fear, um, like hormones that are related to fear hmm. and chemicals that are related to fear. And it also causes the immune system to overact, uh, figuratively attacking everything around it because you're not connected to things that will take care of you. Hmm. So it's not a wonder to me that I developed an illness or, or got an infection that targeted my immune system. My immune system was ready and waiting for something uh, to attack mm. uh, because I was lonely. And, and our emotions have a huge part in whether or not we are well, especially our immune system. Well, wow. and I love that you bring this up. I've never heard it quite like that. And we are, at the essence of it, social beings. We need other people. And I've often heard of people who are you know, not connecting with other people and they get cancer or yes. they have horrible yeah. things happen to them. So now you built that community through getting sick. Now you don't want to have to get sick or have a dreadful illness just to get community. Correct. <laughs> so we'd like to give some tools or tips out there for people who are wanting to create optimum wellness before reaching that point of illness. What would be your suggestions to them? Well, community is a great place to mm -hmm. start. So if you had a tradition of faith that you might have stepped away from for a bit, uh, I would say maybe go back there and visit them. They're pretty nice and friendly. Uh, I, had, I hadn't been in a church congregation in, in a few years. And five weeks before I became ill, I started to attend Marble Collegiate Church, which is right around the corner from my home. And when I love telling this story, because when I was 
it was probably four weeks into me being ill, and I thought that I was dying, but because I couldn't leave the couch, and I was in tremendous pain, and I was calling everyone that I could think of to just pray for me and pray with me. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, oh, well, I'll call Marble Collegiate. The man on the phone, the, the administrator, he prayed with me. Then he sent me to a, uh, the, one of the ministers there. She prayed with me. And then I found out that they have this wonderful program. It's called the Stephen Ministers Program, mm -hmm. where they match you up during times of crisis with someone who will pray with you. Mm -hmm. And I'd never heard of this before. Um, so they did, and my prayer partner is actually here today, mm -hmm. Abby. Um, she, so, yeah. she's, yeah. Uh, she's helped me for the past year. And if it wasn't for her, I would not have had the... Uh, Mm -hmm. the wherewithal to, to heal. Yeah. So find your community. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't have one, make one because it's very, very important. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Many years ago when I was just coming out to living on my own and I was very lonely, like you mentioned, I actually had always loved flamenco. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to try it. I felt totally scared to death. I hid in the back with some cowboy boots and a long skirt. <laughs> and <laughs> looked totally place. Um, but through that experience, I had a 10-year community base. That I had met a lot of wonderful people, people like June here, um, that was uh, part of that team, that, that community that helped me grow into a wonderful adult. Um, so yeah, it's so important. Now also, I think what's also important that you haven't, you've touched on briefly, which is your positive attitude. And I think community can help you and prayer can help you in that area. Um, but in times of really deep crisis, how do you keep your head above water and keep that positive attitude? Well, my head was on fire, <laughs> literally. <laughs> so after three months of being in excruciating pain yeah. and not knowing when the next uh, wave of pain was going to hit, I reached out to Abby one day and I said, hmm. Do you know, do you think maybe it would be all right if the next time I have this attack of pain that I just started to enjoy it? And, I mean, Abby had listened to a lot by that point, and she said, well, you know, uh, you're really suffering a lot, so I say, whatever works, let's just go ahead and try it. And in that conversation, I was almost, by the time we got off the phone, I was almost excited for another pain attack mm. to hit. And... Um, from that point on, the I was also doing lots of other things. I was taking anti-natural uh, antibiotics. I was eating correctly. Mm -hmm. But my pain started to drastically diminish mm -hmm. after that. Um, so one of the main things that I speak to people about is to stop running from your pain and actually owning it. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the fact that I had this pain, it's my pain. I can do mm -hmm. whatever I wanted with it. And it even, I mean, when I tell people I'm on fire now, or when I hear the, the expression, I'm on fire, I'm like, yeah, I am on fire. <laughs> and I really, really was, my mm -hmm. uh, central nervous system was on fire. Mm -hmm. So keeping a sense of humor mm -hmm. and also really warming up to pain. Yeah. Uh, it's not that bad, really. Yeah. Because when you so, come out the other side, you're like, I, I live. Yeah, I'm it's still like here. Completely not that bad. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I love that you mentioned that you can own the pain because I find even in my deepest, darkest times, even when I had autoimmune issue myself with grave disease, that you start to dread the symptoms and then you ki they kind of intensify because you're dreading them and pushing them back and you, and you make them bigger than they are. It's like that monster under the bed. And then when you finally let it come upon you, you're like, oh, okay, I lived. It's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think illness can be a catalyst to growth? I mean, it sounds like it from what happened to you. Well, I, uh, you know, I never would have written a, the book. Maybe, I mean, maybe I would have written a book. I'd had good ideas in the past, but I wasn't so focused. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a catalyst for increased confidence. I mean, if you can come out the other side of a severe illness mm -hmm. with a lot more joy in your life, then, yeah. you know, you really, you really can uh, light up a new room that you, that you want to go in after you've been through something like that. So I think confidence is the biggest thing that I took away from being that ill. Yeah. And has your daily life changed on a whole because of that? Well, I have a com not a completely different uh, regimen. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that I was living relatively healthy before, but my diet is very strict. Uh, my sleep, 
I put sleep as a priority. Mm. So on a daily basis, I, I have my priorities. Uh, my family, spending time with my family, mm. working on specific projects and following through became easier. Um, and, and really, the transition into even more improved eating was not hard. Yeah. I, I really enjoy the way I eat now. And I do miss a cup of coffee every now and then, but that's okay. You know, it's, it's fine. I wouldn't trade it for this, for this life. Yeah. So. Cause now you're feeling awesome. Yeah. <laughs> awesome and confident. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great for anyone who's thinking uh, it's impossible to make the shift. As we said earlier, it's a bit by bit process. It doesn't have to come all at once and you can achieve op optimum wellness. Yes. A little bit at a time. Yeah. A little bit at a Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yeah. So for anyone out there who maybe doesn't have the healthiest lifestyle right now, what tips can you give them to get started today? Because with health, either it be, you know, either nutrition wise or fitness wise or spiritual wise. Take one thing. So I'll give you one tip because that's pretty much my tip, is to just do one thing. So if I were going to say do one thing, mm -hmm. start tracking. Uh, my husband's going to laugh at me when I say this because <laughs> I'm not the best at tracking, and he's excellent at tracking, and he always asks me to start tracking things. But the act of just tracking something that you want to change will produce a change in it. So if you want to sleep better, if you start writing down your sleep patterns, more than likely your sleep will improve just by documenting. And there's, there's research on, on that, the importance of metrics in health. So just pick one thing and start tracking it. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you mention earlier how stress plays a big part in illness and autoimmune issues. And you know what I've heard? That sleep actually causes a great amount of stress in people's life as well as uh, more illness and stuff. So I think sleep is top priority, uh, you yes. know, I would say. I love talking about sleep because has anyone seen? <laughs> You're like, yay. Has, it, has anyone seen the TED talk on the new research on sleep? No. So there, I don't remember the man's name, but they, for a long time, didn't understand mm -hmm. until just within the past two years why we sleep, and they just discovered why there is a specific reason why we sleep, mm -hmm. and the brain has this beautiful way of flushing out and cleaning out all of the. Uh, toxic, dead, cellular stuff mm -hmm. um, in the brain and flushing it out as we sleep. Uh, and they just found that out this mm -hmm. year. So sleeping, natural sleep, so not sleep on Xanax or sl sleeping medications because it doesn't quite work the same. But if you can start to just sleep naturally, this they think that it's linked to uh, Alzheimer's. Hmm. Uh, because the chemical that is associated with al Alzheimer's mm -hmm. is what gets flushed out during the healthy sleeping process. Mm -hmm. So there's a link between Alzheimer's and insomnia. Um, so yes, sleep is very, very important. I wake up every morning so happy that I can sleep now because I had sleep problems for a long time, even before I was sick. Yeah, and I found for myself, when I was at my most stressed, I was getting six hours of sleep a day, drinking tons of coffee. Be like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and not a good way to be. Yeah. But I want everyone to find out, you know, who's listening in, who might not be here live, where they can get a, a book or find out more about you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 30daysofprayer.org, mm -hmm. 30, 30daysofprayer.org. Yes. And everyone here in this room, you can go get your signed copy today and buy it directly from Rochelle. Yes. And Rochelle, I want to thank you for sharing this very important topic because uh, we want to get Americans healthier and the world healthier because with a healthy world, we can grow as an awesome community. Thank you. So I want to thank you for coming to Savvy Central Radio. Thank you. Thank you so much.